clips. So what are your thoughts? What, 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 is, what is this making you feel, uh, Duncan, seeing this? Oh, I think it's beautiful. I mean, it's just stunning. I mean, again, as I say, it, it, it's, it's one of those events that makes you appreciate that we do live on a rock and day-to-day -day life occurs, but once in a while you look to the heavens and something happens that make you, makes you... But it, 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 it puts things in, in perspective for me. And as I say, the, the feed here from Dubai, uh, the, the, the telescope in Dubai, is just, just wonderful. Uh, it's interesting you were talking about eclipses. Uh, when I was working with the Houston Symphony for the, the project I did with them, the, it's, it's called The Planets and HD Odyssey, uh, and, and you were talking a little bit about that earlier. One thing that we did is we went back and looked at a lot of data from some of the spacecraft that went to other planets, and one of them, Cassini, which uh, has had the most successful mission, it's breathtaking, the images, uh, is in orbit around Saturn, the ringed planet, which is beautiful. But Saturn has this entourage of moons, and um, Cassini, the spacecraft, has been able to capture these movies as these moons dart in and out of Saturn's shadow. So these moons that uh, orbit Saturn are constantly going through this eclipse cycle. Of course, we only have one moon, but the, uh, the outer planets, the gaseous giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they have a whole suite of moons. And uh, it's wonderful to watch this sort of celestial dance as these moons dip in and out of the shadow of their planets that they orbit. And uh, pulling some of those images images together and setting them to music and it, it's almost the the harmony of the spheres and uh, uh, the Houston Symphony obviously perform Holst's The Planets and Holst had no idea that these worlds existed when he wrote his music and and so it was a joy to be able to have that opportunity to put these images to the music. Well how and, would one obtain that? Is it, is it available? Oh, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, the, the, there are a number of um, places in, 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 the, in the U.S. where um, uh, various orchestras are going to play uh, the, the Planet Suite to, to the visual presentation that I, uh, I, um, I made for them. Um, but if you wanted to get hold, we made a DVD, actually. We, we made a DVD and a Blu-ray of the live performance. So you see all the pictures that I use and you see and you hear the music as well. So what is and it called again? How, it's how would called, one find it's, it? It's called The Planets, an HD Odyssey, and I guess the best way is to go to uh, the Houston Symphony, their, their web page, and, and it's www.houstonsymphony, which is all one word, dot org, O-R-G, and there's a little there's a little icon there of Saturn, and if you click on that, and if you wanted to get hold of the Blu-ray or the DVD, you'd be able to. But we we were able to plunder all these beautiful satellite images, and you realise that what's happening now live in front of us is not unique to the Earth at all. In fact, all the time throughout just our solar system, there are constant eclipses as moons and asteroids and ring particles move in and out of the shadow of the various planets planets that they they orbit so it was a wonderful it's it was just very evocative i think to put put those images to, to music and to think that holst really at the turn of the, the, the last century had no idea that these bodies existed and we actually that there's a, a, a sort of a bonus DVD that you get if if you buy the um, if 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 you if you buy the production and I went back to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory there in uh, in California and interviewed a lot of the scientists and the engineers who built these spacecraft and they tell the most wonderful tales of what it took to construct the spacecraft, send the spacecraft out, and watch the images come back. And I think even even they uh, have seen. Uh, uh, various images. Of course, they get to see all the images that really are quite spectacular. And what quite a time to be alive, isn't it? What yeah, time. oh, absolutely. It really is a golden age of astronomy and space exploration. And I think a lot of, uh, in the future, a lot of people will look back and think of Hubble and think of Cassini and think of Voyager uh, and the lunar landings as, as, as a real um, uh, golden period of exploration. Long may it last. 
This is Bob Berman, and we are looking at the live lunar eclipse presented by SLU and Google. SLU is S-L-O-O-H. Uh, you're probably watching this on eclipse.slu.com, but certainly slu.com will take you to other wonders of the world if you wish. And uh, I'd like to introduce our next guest. She's a solar expert. And uh, since uh, we're in a plugging mood right now, I'm going to unashamedly say that my my book, The Sun's Heartbeat, uh, published by Little Brown, will be out in a month. And it's only because of writing this book that I can probably not come across as a complete idiot while I interview uh, our next guest, uh, Lucy Green. Now, the... Uh, uh, sun is, uh, of course, the nearest star, and uh, it is sunlight that we're still seeing on the moon, even though the moon is uh, fully eclipsed. So uh, let me welcome uh, Lucy Green from uh, England. Are you there? I am here. Hi. Hi. Hello, Lucy. Hi. <laughs> so what do you think so far? What, uh, what do you think of this eclipse? Oh, it's been fabulous so far. And actually, I, I'm, I'm looking out of the window in the UK, and uh, it's kind of clearing up so i'm hoping to catch the tail end or be able to see it out of my window later on all right it's been, yeah, it's been <laughs> fabulous to see it through um, through slew and uh, could, could you tell us something about uh, i mean you you told me on the phone the other day about how uh, i was wondering how we were going to tie your sun expertise in with a lunar eclipse and you pointed out that uh, the moon's surface is changing because of being hit by uh, sunlight. Uh, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So the moon is being bombarded by sunlight, but also by um, particles coming from the sun. So I'm a solar scientist, and I, I, I view the sun probably differently to um, a lot of people. Um, I mean, I certainly before I started start studying the sun, I, I viewed it as this separate object in the solar system that was quite unconnected to us here on the Earth. But now, after having studied it, I, I see the sun as an object that gives off lots of particles, something that we call the solar wind. And this is, these are charged particles, and they flow out from the sun all the time, and it's gusty wind. And it flows out to the edge of the solar system, 17 billion kilometers away. Yeah, so I, under I, stand they, I understand they ridiculed Eugene Parker in the, in the 1950s when he first came up with that idea. Astronomers were saying, what a stupid idea that is, a yeah. wind that blows from the sun. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. And now it's such a fundamental thing for us. And um, it, it creates beautiful things like the comet's tails. It's the reason that cometary tails blow off and um, you know, create these millions of kilometers long, long beautiful effects. But, um, the interesting so, thing so they're like we comet tails are like weather vanes, aren't they? That are being yeah. uh, blown by the uh, the wind of the from the sun. Yeah, that's right. And actually, one of the students, one of the PhD students that I work with, is interested in in using comet tails to investigate the wind being blown off from the sun. And he's wanting to work with amateur astronomers who are taking photos of the comets and then put all these images together and kind of get a map of how the solar wind. Um, how these particles from the sun, how it how it varies across the solar system, which is just such a fantastic. Yeah, how idea. interesting! Yeah, it sounds it's great. fascinating. You know, you know, they say the best way to learn about anything is to write a book about it. So, uh, I found in this last year and a half. Uh, uh, just fascinating things I never knew about the sun. I, I, I'm just sorry that I never that I didn't contact you because you said something uh, the other day uh, to me that was uh, that was uh, fascinating. We know that uh, for over a century now that the solar phenomena are essentially uh, magnetically induced. But didn't you say something that the, uh, the these giant storms on the sun, these CMEs, are places where the how did you put it? They where the, where it's necessary for the sun's health, right? Yeah, that's right. I um, I study the magnetic fields of the sun's atmosphere. So these these particles that blow off um, in form of the, the wind, if I can describe it that way, ultimately come from the sun's atmosphere. But there's also these very large magnetic fields there, and they too erupt into the solar system and form something called a coronal mass ejection. And for people that know me, I'm always talking about coronal mass ejections. But they are necessary for the sun. The sun creates a magnetic field deep inside the, the star, and it rises into the sun's atmosphere. And if it doesn't get ejected, then it would endlessly accumulate. So I see these coronal mass ejections as a valve for the magnetic field to escape the sun and, and prevent an endless accumulation. But, 
you know, it, the magnetic field goes somewhere. And I was really intrigued by the, um, the NASA news story last week, I think it was, about the discovery by the Voyager spacecraft, which are now at the edge oh, of the yes. bubble of hot gases and magnetic field um, created by the sun, the edge of the heliosphere, that's what it's called, and um, how it's all bubbly at the edge of the, uh, where these Voyager spacecraft are now. And I just thought, oh, that was just fantastic, because that, that's where these bubbles of magnetic field in the form of coronal mass ejections end up. What a time to be alive, huh? What a time to be alive. Oh, uh, now, now, are you involved at all in uh, helioseismology? Um, I'm not, but I pay a lot of attention to it because helioseismology is the only way in which we can study uh, the interior of the sun. Could you tell our uh, listeners and uh, viewers what that is? Yeah, so it's a really nice technique that uses the fact that the sun rings like a bell because it has sound waves bouncing around inside the star. And these sound waves, they're in motion, sound is in motion, and it causes the surface of the sun to, to, to move up and down. And we can actually measure these movements, which is incredible. So you look at the, the, the surface of the sun rising up and down and all the patterns that are created, and then you take those patterns and you can infer what's happening inside the sun. It's, I mean, it's very mathematical, um, but... Incredible. I mean, they do it for the sun, but they also do it for other stars, too. But so is it a little bit the way uh, earthquake experts here, seismologists, yeah. can uh, infer what's below the Earth's surface because of the uh, the motions of our surface? So the same thing is done with the sun. Would you say that's so uh, accurate? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And we'd like to do it on the moon as well, actually. So <laughs> a technique that can be used throughout, throughout the universe. Oh, that's it. You've brought up a good point because uh, didn't we find that the moon, when it struck, uh, rings like a bell for up to two hours? Yeah, yeah. The moon has, um, has sound waves and, it, and it's thought to have um, quakes, moon quakes. So it's one thing that before we maybe put humans on the moon, if we're ever able to do that, that, that might, want, might need to be studied. You might want to make sure you build your lunar base somewhere that's, uh, that's free from, from moonquakes, yeah. So, yeah. Now, a number of people are saying, I've noticed there's a difference here between Duncan, who optimistically was saying that we'll return to the moon uh, someday, I'm sure we will, and uh, Lucy, who's a little more... I would say op, uh, realistic, perhaps, or maybe pessimistic, saying mm -hmm. that if we ever do go back to the moon. But one of the stoppers is uh, something that Lucy mentioned earlier, and that is those particles from the sun and uh, radiation, which um, one of our women astronauts, Shannon Lucid, who spent more time in space than any other uh, U.S. Female astronaut, anyway, really believes will be a stopper that the amount of radiation. Mm -hmm. I've read a figure that on a two year Mars mission, the astronauts uh, will get so much radiation that um, somewhere between 15 and 40 percent of their brains will be destroyed. It, it and, is something that has to be considered, yeah. Yeah, and even us smart people can't afford that. Absolutely, no. I'd, uh, I think I'd be out of the if that happened to me. But, you know, I'd be in an awful state. <laughs> <laughs> these, these particles that come from the sun, um, they're very small, they, they carry a charge, and, and they have a lot of energy. And they're constantly blowing out from the sun. But um, there are also other events, I mean, similar to the coronal mass ejections that I mentioned earlier, but other events called solar flares, so between the solar wind, coronal mass ejection, and solar flares, you get a lot of very, very high-energy particles given um, into the solar system. And um, on the Earth, we're protected by the fact that we have a magnetic field. That's a really good barrier to these particles. But the moon is um, moving in and out of the Earth's magnetic field. And so I, I, I kind of see the solar system with magnetic eyes. So the sun has a magnetic field, the Earth has a magnetic field, and, and the, the moon is, is skimming in and out of the Earth's magnetic field. So sometimes um, on the lunar surface you're protected from that coming from the sun, but then when you move outside of it, you are not protected. And so the Apollo astronauts in particular, they, I mean, I think actually it turns out they were quite lucky to not have received... Um, big particle doses from the sun. They they managed to not be on the lunar surface when um, some large solar flares happened. Yeah, I understand that Apollo 17, if it had happened a month or so later, it would have mm. been a different story. Yeah, yes. that's, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I read that um, they think that fatal doses of particles 